Decisive actions of the U.S. Navy, throughout the first months of 1944, allowed the Pacific Fleet to roam freely in the Central Pacific. Successful operations in Marshall Islands archipelago, and relatively easy and quick victories at Majuro, Kwajalein and Eniwetok atolls, gave the protected forward area anchorages for the entire fleet. And the assembly area for large amphibious forces, together with sufficient land area for airstrips, suited for all types of aircraft. The bypassed atolls, in Gilbert and Marshall Islands, still held by Japanese garrisons, were starved and neutralized by air and naval blockade. Airstrikes executed on Truck Island, as part of Operation Hailstone, and subsequent attacks, had rendered that strong Japanese base, temporarily unusable. In the Southwest Pacific, by the spring of 1944, American and Australian troops, under General Douglas MacArthur, Commander-in-Chief in Southwest Pacific, made good progress. The Solomon and Bismarck Islands, have long been secured. The great Japanese naval and air base at Rabaul, met the same faith, as the bases on the Truk Island. These successes, demanded continued pressure on Japanese defenses, and the launch of the next major operation in the Central Pacific area, but the question was where. Unlike Gilbert and Marshall Islands, the selection of Marianas as an objective, was not so distinct. The Casablanca Conference, in January 1943, established the main goals of the war in the Pacific. However, the Mariana Islands, were not included among them. Later that year, during the Trident Conference in Washington, the objectives in the Central Pacific, were expanded, but the Marianas again, were not specifically included. At both conferences, the Navy argued the strategic importance of Marianas, as a base for further actions, to liberate the Philippines, and potential invasion of Japan, but this was ignored. At the same time, General MacArthur, remained completely focused on the Southwest Pacific Drive, aiming to seize the Philippines via New Guinea. He opposed major thrust through the Central Pacific, fearing that it would consume much-needed resources, from his efforts. It was not until Cairo Conference, in November 1943, that the capture of the Marianas, was formally endorsed. It was then when Admiral Ernest King, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Fleet, the main advocate of Marianas operation, received support from the Army Air Force planners. Air Force, considered the airfields on the Marianas, were large enough to support the operations, of the new long-range bomber, the B-29. From bases on Mariana Islands, most Japanese cities, including Tokyo, would be well within the range of B-29 bombers, and could be easily supplied by ships, directly from United States. Decisions reached during Cairo Conference, have been incorporated in the Central Pacific, Operation Plan Granite, issued on December 27, 1943. According to the Granite Plan schedule, the attack on Saipan, Tinian and Guam in the Marianas, was set for November 14, 1944. The swift progress of the campaign in the Central Pacific, success in Marshall Islands, and most importantly, neutralization of Truk Island, led to a revision of the plan, and rescheduling of the target dates. However, there were still doubts, about where to strike first. Admiral Chester Nimitz, commander of the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet, planned to attack the Palau's Islands first, then go on to the Marianas, but under pressure from the Air Force, the final decision was to assault, the Marianas first. The new date for the Mariana operation, was set for June 15, 1944, which was finally confirmed, at the Washington Planning Conference, by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in February 1944. For the operations on the Marianas, the Navy assigned the 5th Fleet, under Admiral Raymond Spruance, the largest fleet ever assembled in the Pacific, with more than 800 ships, tasked to transport, cover and support the landing operation. The land operations on Saipan and Tinian, 
just three nautical miles away to the south of Saipan, was the task of the 5th Amphibious Corps, consisting of the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions, commanded by Generals Thomas E. Watson and Harry Schmidt. The 27th Infantry Division, under Major General Ralph E. Smith, formed Corps Reserve, while the artillery support, was the task of the 21st Corps Artillery. Once ashore, the land troops of the Northern Attack Force, would be under the overall command, of General Holand Smith. On May 25, 1944, the first troop transport ships, departed from Hawaii for the assembly area, in the Marshall Islands. The expeditionary force, began to assemble in Eniwetok Lagoon on June 6, and on June 11, the large armada set sail to the Marianas. On the same day, when the first transport and escort ships, reached the assembly area on the Marshall Islands, the 15 mostly newly built Essex-class aircraft carriers, 7 new battleships, 13 cruisers and 58 destroyers. Of the fast carrier force, under Vice Admiral Mark A. Mitcher, departed from Majuro, and headed for the Marianas. The objective of the fast carrier, Task Force 58, which sailed a few days before the main fleet, was to carry out preparatory naval and air bombardment of the Marianas, with its battleships, and more than 900 carrier-based planes. During the voyage, the troops had been thoroughly briefed, on the plans for the upcoming operation, codenamed Forager. In contrast to the coral atolls of Gilbert and Marshall Archipelago, 15 islands that compose the Mariana Islands chain, are mostly volcanic mountains, forming a part of the submerged mountain range. The archipelago, is divided into two subgroups, a northern group, formed of ten uninhabited volcanic islands, and a southern, with five coralline limestone islands. The island chain, extends more than 2,000 kilometers, from north to south, and stands on a supply route, from the Japanese mainland to the Caroline Islands. It is also situated on the direct way, from Hawaii to Philippines. Of these 15 islands, only Saipan, Tinian, Rota, and Guam, all in the southern Marianas, were worthily military objectives. The second largest island in the Marianas, Saipan, is covered with mountains, measuring 20 kilometers from northeast to southwest, and 9 kilometers wide. Much of the coastline is covered with cliffs, leaving only a small part of the beach line, suitable for an amphibious landing. After careful review of Saipan geography, the Navy planners decided to land two divisions simultaneously, on the beaches on the southwestern corner of the island, designated from north to south as, red, green, blue, and yellow. The 2nd Marine Division, already experienced in fighting on Guadalcanal and Tarawa, would land with the 6th Marines on Red, while the 8th Marines, would land on Green Beach. Further to the south, veterans of Royinama Battle, the men of the 4th Marine Division, would land with its 23rd Marines on Blue, and 25th Marines on Yellow Beach. The remaining Marine units, and the 27th Infantry Division, would stay in reserve. The area designated as a Fetna Point, just north of Charankanoa village, marked the boundary between two divisions. According to plan, the 2nd Marine Division, would advance on the left flank towards Tepochau, and Tipo Pale Mountains, while the 4th Marine Division, would take Charankanoa. And after reaching Objective 1 line, set for the D-Day, continue with an advance towards a Sleto airfield, to secure the southern part of the island. Afterwards, the 4th Marine Division, would take on the right flank, and continue to advance across Margisian Bay. Over-optimistic plan, entirely overlooked rugged terrain, the Marines would face, and the Japanese defense. The intelligence reports suggested 9,000, up to a maximum of 18,000 Japanese troops on Saipan. In fact, there were more than 29,000 men, of the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy, stationed on the island, including more than 40 tanks, and many more artillery weapons. Right after the fall of Marshall Islands, 
the Japanese high command, expected the next attack to come somewhere either on Palau's, Western Carolines, or the Marianas. Therefore, they decided to send reinforcements into the area. By June 1944, the garrison at Saipan, had grown to include more than 13 infantry battalions, mostly part of the 43rd Division, and 47th Mixed Brigade, as well as various other naval, maintenance, and many other units. The Japanese forces on Saipan, formed part of the 31st Army, grouped into the Northern Mariana Army Group, under Lieutenant General Yoshitsugu Sato, while Vice Admiral Chuichi Negumo. Fleet commander during the attack on Pearl Harbor, and later during the battle at Midway, commanded the Imperial Navy troops on Saipan. Also, the size of Saipan, with plenty of room for maneuver, allowed the Japanese forces to finally prepare a decent defense in depth, place the artillery positions, and organize an appropriate reserve. Therefore, General Sato, divided Saipan into four defense sectors, with the bulk of the forces, stationed along the western coast, most suitable for amphibious assault. The 135th Infantry Regiment, held the northern sector. The naval sector, encompassed Tanapag Bay and Garapan, the largest settlement on the island, was guarded by the 5th Special Base Force, battalion-sized Special Naval Landing Unit, and the 1st Battalion of the 136th Infantry Regiment. The 136th Regiment, held the central sector. The southern sector, was the largest of all, and was guarded by the 47th Mixed Brigade, and a reserve force. In addition to land forces, the Japanese deployed more than 540 land-based planes, and many warships into the Marianas. These preparations, were a part of the Ego Plan, set by the Imperial Japanese Navy, for the decisive engagement, against the invading U.S. fleet. The operation called, for the use of the remaining land-based aircraft in Marianas, Palau's, and Caroline Islands, as well as carrier-based planes, from the remaining Japanese aircraft carriers, and other warships, aiming to defeat the U.S. Navy, in a single decisive battle. On June 11, 1944, ships of Task Force 58, arrived in the Marianas. Originally, the naval and air bombardment, was to begin at the dawn of June 12. However, Vice Admiral Mitcher, wanted to change the usual pattern of the attacks at dawn, so he recommended to Admiral Spruance, that the fighter sweeps begin in the afternoon, as soon as his fleet, reached the area. Spruance, approved his plan, and while the carriers were still 300 kilometers east of the island, the first 225 planes, took off, and went to attack Japanese airfields in southern Marianas. The surprise was massive. The first air attack, destroyed many enemy planes still on the ground, and in air-to-air -air combat. Although, a precise number of destroyed Japanese planes, vary from source to source, from 150 to just 36, the fact is, that Navy planes gained complete control in the air, thanks to the afternoon fighter sweep. On June 13, battleships and cruisers, reached their destinations in front of Saipan, and three days naval shelling began. The following day, on June 14, newly arrived ships, of the Northern Attack Force, joined the shelling. At the dawn of June 14, covered by naval bombardment, the underwater demolition teams, began removing mines and underwater obstacles, immediately offshore, blasting parts of the reefs to clear the routes, for landing craft and tanks. Losing four men killed and seven wounded, while performing this dangerous mission. With the first light of June 15, 1944, Marines began boarding their landing craft. The already common difficulties, with the assembly and positioning of the invasion force, led to delays, before the first wave headed to shore. Shortly after 8 a.m., protected by the naval gunfire, and naval air force support, the first landing craft, began to approach the shore. The enemy fire was sporadic, until marines reached the coral reef ring, 
surrounding the island, and then the Japanese defenders, opened fire with all they had. Artillery, mortar and machine gun fire swept the entire beach. At about 8.43 am, the first wave, of about 8,000 men, of the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions, hit the beach under heavy fire, suffering heavy casualties. The 6th Marines, alongside the 8th Marines of the 2nd Marine Division, landed on Red and Green Beach, with most units veering off course, further to the north, which widened the gap at Afton a point, between two divisions. Of the 68 armored amphibian vehicles, of the 2nd Marine Division, three were disabled before reaching the beach, and 28 more, were disabled in the first few hundred meters inland. After a while, the 2nd Marine Division, on the north flank, faced marshes north of Lake Susup, and the heaviest Japanese resistance. Throughout the day, casualties mounted, especially among the officers. All four assault battalion commanders, of the 2nd Marine Division, became casualties early in the battle. The 2nd Battalion, 6th Marines, had four different battalion commanders on D-Day. Very soon, the 2nd Division progress stalled, having advanced only a few hundred meters inland, and with all units, failed to reach Objective 1 line, set for the D-Day. Meanwhile, on the right flank, the men of the 4th Marine Division, landed on its assigned beaches. However, the division progress, was not without trouble. On the far right, the 25th Marines on Yellow Beach, faced heavy flanking fire, from well-prepared Japanese defensive positions at a Jingan point, suffering extremely heavy casualties. Later that morning, the 25th Marines, had to repel enemy counterattack. It was not until early afternoon, that Marines secured Jingan Point. The landing of the 23rd Marines, on Blue Beach, passed without serious difficulties, with the Marines, encountering only sporadic enemy fire. Shortly after landing, Charon Kanoa was secured, and Marines advanced, having more trouble overcoming rugged terrain and swamps, than with enemy actions. The gap between the two divisions, exposed the 4th Division left flank. Therefore, at 10.55 am, the first men of the Divisional Reserve, began to land in order to close the existing gap. By afternoon, both Divisions Reserve, and the Tank Support Units, began landing, and by night they reached, designated positions. Although some units, managed to reach objectives set for the D-Day, the progress on the first day was disappointing. The landing did not pass without problems. A large number of Marines, landed in a short time, on the shallow beachhead, which led to congestion, and it is why the enemy artillery and mortar fire, took a heavy toll. In confusion, many units became mixed up. Also, the terrain proved to be much more difficult in reality, than on maps which ultimately resulted in exposing the Marines, as excellent targets, for enemy fire. In some cases, Japanese troops, filtered through the gaps between companies, inflicting heavy casualties on Marines. On the first day, both Marine divisions, had over 2,000 casualties, heavy losses suffered, for occupying only, a tiny part, of Saipan.